All right. All right, microbiology. In case you guys haven't figured it out, microbiology is not the study, I'm sorry. It's not the study of small biology, tiny biology. Uh, it's the study of microbes, okay? So these microbes and anything that fall, you know, qualifies into that study of microbiology, anything that can't be seen with a naked eye, if you have to have a microscope to see it, okay? This will be anything that might make you um, sick or whatever like that. And a lot of people, when they come to the class at first, they think about maybe a handful of things when I ask them to like name a microorganism. Everybody starts off with COVID. Correct, that's a microorganism. Um, then some people might come with like, I don't know, flu, that's a virus, that's a microorganism, sure. Um, anybody have any bacteria they can think of? Okay, so you guys are going to be nurses, right? Thank you. So that's exactly right. So MRSA, that is a great example of one that you will be con you know, experiencing when you are working in hospital setting, um, if you aren't already. And um, another one that you'll see a lot of in a hospital setting, C. diff. So that's Clostridium difficile. That's a bacterial diarrhea, basically. And it can spread throughout the hospital because it's a very resilient bacteria. So we'll be getting into those as well as things like salmonella and the plague and Ebola and all this other things more fancy stuff too and stuff you have never even heard of that's going to give you nightmares at night we'll get into all that stuff and have a good time with that throughout this course all right when we say microorganisms these organisms here are the ones that fall into the category the ones that have cells um you think they all do but they don't the ones that actually have cells and that's kind of how we've defined living things is that they have them uh, bacteria something called archaea which you've probably never heard of um, fungi, protozoa, and helminths. Okay, so we know what bacteria are. Archaea are very, very similar, but they just live in extreme environments typically. There are some archaea that like live in your mouth. They're part of like your mouth biome and um, can be involved in dental caries. So, you know, tooth decay. So they're, hey, they do have something to do. And dental caries, by the way, tooth decay is the number one um, <laughs> disease, I guess like you said, microorganism disease. Uh, in all of humanity, FYI, so, um, whatever. So fungi, you guys know what that is. We've seen mushrooms and all that, but we've heard of like penicillin and fuzzy mold and all that. Um, don't forget that yeast falls into fungi. Okay? Yeast is just a type of fungi. And there's a lot of different kinds of yeast. We're not just talking about candida albicans. We're talking about other kinds too. So protozoa, these are eukaryotic cells. We'll talk about what that means later on, but um, these are things like malaria, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of others like toxoplasmosis, which is what you can get from handling cat litter when you're pregnant. Um, there's a whole bunch of others too. Helminths, these are a little bit more fun. You probably never heard the term, but I know you've heard of some of the um, diseases and they're terrifying. These are like the worms, right? So it's gonna be like tapeworms and giant intestinal roundworm and everything like that. So terrifying. Um, do we have, does anybody know in the United States, are there any helminths or worm infections? Do we have any? Yes, tapeworms. Tapeworms, you can get tapeworm in the United States. Does anybody know another one? Yeah, so roundworms, so that's a little, a little vague just because that's uh, a kind of worm. Yes, so like a, a category. But um, there is something called um, Enterobius vermicularis, that is the pinworm. The pinworm is like the little worms that they'll stick out of your kid's butthole. Like, yes, this is a thing. And it's not uncommon. Um, I think it spreads through like um, sand, uh, sand pits or whatever I want to call it, sandboxes, stuff like that. Cats come and poop in it and whatever the, the worm gets there. Kids are dirty and they scratch um, their butthole and then they play with another kid and then they touch it to their mouths and that's how it gets spread around or through the cat feces or whatever, right? Not uncommon. Um, usually your kid will have an itchy bum and then you put a piece of tape on it overnight. Yeah. And then take the tape off. And if there's worms on it, you know what it is. Take them to the doctor, get some um, medication for that. And it's a helmet sick drug. drugs. Um, another one that does not infect people, what can, super, super rare for it to be people, but very, very common in pets is heartworm. Yeah. So we know we've probably seen images of that whole heart being completely clogged up with worms. Um, I recently adopted two little dogs from a rescue and they were like, well, they're going to require extra attention. They have heartworms. It's actually pretty difficult to treat heartworms. 
Um, and so I was like, I mean, who better to kind of understand that and deal with that than microbiologists? Most people think that that's going to spread to other animals or whatever like that. It's only spread by the mosquito. That's the only way. And whatever. They're running around playing just fine. So, but they'll get their treatment soon. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of categories that things can fit into. We also have organisms, microorganisms that are non-cellular. And I'm not going to define whether they're alive or not. I'm going to leave that up to you guys, what you think alive is. But viruses, viruses are literally like some DNA coated in protein to protect it. It doesn't do anything else, the protein. So how does it function? How does it do what it needs to do? It pops into your cell and takes over your machinery in your cell. Your machinery comes and interacts with it and it starts cranking out virus and virus and virus and virus, right? That's how viruses, is that alive though? It doesn't even have, some of them don't even have like a membrane like our cells do. So I don't know. That's up to you. Decide it. Decide it for yourselves. Um, they can be pretty small, like poliovirus, which is simple um, genome with the protein, or they can be kind of bigger ones, they can, like smallpox. Smallpox is a giant virus, has a huge membrane around it, and it's got all this complicated stuff going on inside of it. So a lot of variety there. COVID is somewhere in the middle. Um, so that's viruses. And then prions are infectious protein particles. They're just misfolded proteins that um, are full of right sequence just didn't meet up with their amino acids across the way correctly, right? They didn't fold correctly. They can't do their job correctly. And so what happens typically is because a lot of the water interacting molecules aren't where they're supposed to be, and a lot of the water fearing molecules are where they're not supposed to be, um, they tend to aggregate together. They'll stick together. Then we form these plaques. And as a result, these tend to aggregate in the brain, in the brain tissue. And we get something called spongy form, like sponges, holes developed in the brain, spongiform encephalopathies. So if you've ever heard of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, that's mad cow disease. So that's what we're talking about here, okay? That's prions. They're just a protein that isn't folded right. Um, you kind of get the idea of what microbiologists are gonna study. We're gonna study about the organism itself um, down to its genetics, up to where it lives and how it affects all of us. And uh, we think there's two kinds of cells. There's A-karyotes and there's eukaryotes, okay? And we're going to break it down in our chapters in chapter four and five later. Chapter four is the A karyotes and chapter five is U karyotes. A karyote looks like A, um, yeah, A karyote. Uh, A typical, not typical, right? So doesn't have karyo. Karyo is nucleus, okay? Um, so if you think of karyotyping, if you've ever heard of that, like genetics, like putting the X's and Y's together to look at um, the chromosomes, that's karyotyping. Um, but yeah, so whether or not it has a nucleus, that's what we're asking here. A karyo doesn't have a nucleus. U karyo, U means true. Okay. True nucleus. So obviously we would think the more complicated thing, the eukaryotes probably came from the progenitor being the non-eukaryotes, the A karyotes. It's a process. Of course, we can go back in time and prove it, but that's the idea. Um, so bacteria and archaea, they are the akaryotes. They're the only ones that are the akaryotes. Bacteria and archaea, all of them are akaryotes. Okay. Um, everything else is divided into the eukaryotes. So evolution, um, the theory of evolution is pretty observable and testable. Actually, people don't realize that. They think that I'm talking about where humans came from. I'm not touching that, okay? I'm not touching that. You believe what you want to believe with that. What I'm going to tell you is that bacteria definitely evolved. I can show you videos of it happening, okay? If I take E. coli and I played it, this is a video, one of them, and I played it on auger, which is what is you know, a solid surface that will grow the bacteria on, just plain old E. coli out of just, I don't know, nowhere, got no special genes or anything, and then put it next to auger that has uh, antibiotic, that you might take that concentration to actually cure something, and then 10 times that, and then 100 times that, and so on and so forth, right? Um, it will only take it like maybe two days tops, maybe, maybe a week, up to a week, depending on the strains you're dealing with, to get all the way to that 10,000 times. We didn't give it anything, did nothing to it. We just exposed it to this scenario. So how is it doing that? Is it thinking like, oh, I need to do this? Absolutely not. You know, they don't think there's not anything going on there. They just happen to have a high rate of mutation. And sometimes a mutation will help it survive a condition better. And when it does, that organism grows on and fills the next area, right? So one just happened to grow that could survive the higher concentration. It filled up the area and that just happens step by step. Do you know what we call that? There's no, 
natural selection. That's what that is. That's evolution. That is evolution, literally the definition of it. So we have natural selection going on there, survival of the fittest. So only the fittest, the one that had the gene, grew on to you know, go to the next step. So that's evolution. I'm not talking about any other aspect of it, but for microbes, you can't deny it. It happens. You can see it happening. So, um, but yeah, that's all it means. So uh, our organisms, back in the back old days, we didn't have oxygen in our atmosphere at all. And some my organisms came into existence that were able to basically convert their environments and a byproduct was oxygen. These are our photosynthetic organisms. Um, we think of plants as providing our oxygen in our um, planet, but it's 70% provided by microorganisms. So we're talking about algae. That counts as a microorganism. Algae, kelp, um, and uh, plankton, mostly. And then the cyanobacteria, which they're just photosynthetic bacteria. That's where our uh, whole environment came from. Of course, we can't go back in time and prove that, but yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> See, uh, decomposition. This is no surprise that bacteria and fungi are going to be involved in breaking down dead things. This is an obvious thing, right? Um, dead things, we call it detritus or detritus. I don't care how you pronounce it, but that's the word as long as you can recognize it. Um, so yeah, fungi and bacteria do that. And that is called saprobes. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just to introduce that term. Um, yeah. One of the things that is kind of important to understand about microbes in our environment is that um, something that's being affected is like uh, crops right now. Crops right now are being severely affected by global warming. You might have heard about this. We have countries that are you know, in severe danger of starving. Um, whole countries that are in danger, like Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka right now has a huge problem with food shortage. Why? Well, part of it is they're an island, and so they have to bring some of their foods in. The other part is they can't get their plants to grow. Well, they live in the tropics, and like a lot of areas in the tropics, it's just getting hotter. And it's too hot for the bacteria to survive that are in the soil. Those bacteria break down stuff in the atmosphere and the soil to give nitrogen to the plants. And if the bacteria aren't there to give nitrogen to plants, the plants can't grow. Because nitrogen, as you'll learn, I'm sure if you remember from chemistry, if you had it recently, nitrogen is important for our nitrogenous bases and DNA. It's important for our amino acids, amino being that group at the end, NH2. It's essential for a living organism. So um, it's becoming a real problem, our change in the climate and affecting that sort of stuff. So it's not only going to be affecting us through, you know, it makes our oxygen and all this other stuff. Um, we also can get other more happy, cheerful things from our organisms like beer and stuff. Um, we know about bread, wine, and beer with our yeasts and how um, that can lead to fermentation and creating alcohol. Um, cheese production with fungi. And we know penicillin came from molds. We've seen that happening all the way back into Egypt. They have evidence of people using it that way. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and you can imagine how that would work if I took a fungus that was growing on an area, I don't even care, the, the bread, sure. Um, but it's creating penicillin just naturally on its own. It's staving off bacteria from coming in and taking the nutrients that it wants. So that's why it's actually an effective thing for the mold. But we've learned how to make it useful for us. I think that is super cool. Um, and you guys know that we have science now, right? Modern science that allows us to manipulate these organisms and take advantage of them as well um, in a lot of different ways. So. Moving on. So anytime that you have a disease that is caused by something transmissible, I'm defining this specifically because there's a reason. If it is transmissible, it's being transmitted by microorganisms that cause disease, they're called pathogens. Pathogens are just microorganisms that cause disease. Can you guys name one disease that is not caused by pathogens? Just one. Think of any. Yes. Diabetes, exactly. So that's exactly where I'm coming from. So when we start talking about these diseases, it's easy to get kind of caught up in the infectious diseases. Don't forget about diabetes, you know, heart disease, stroke, things like these. Those where, you know, you guys going into nursing are definitely going to need to be aware of those, um, as well as this stuff. But yeah, we have the difference there. 
caused by microbes or not caused by microbes. Here we have outlined here the top ca causes of death in the U.S. and this was as of 2022. Um, clearly, we have heart disease and cancer that's kind of been like that for a while. And then number three is COVID. We have more people dying that at that time from COVID than we have people dying from stroke and diabetes. If you guys have ever worked at a place like Southwest Integris, Southwest Integris has a population of folks who do not take care of themselves or are incapable of doing so. Whether it's money or I don't know, you know, they just haven't been taught. So there's a situation, um, we get a lot of folks there who have diabetes. And when I worked in the lab at um, Integris Southwest, I got a lot of feet. They don't come from people who don't have diabetes. I'm just saying. So um, that's, it's no joke. And we would get like, we always had a foot coming in. Like it was always, it's like every day, at least one foot, at least. We even had a day where we had some money. We had to like have a storage area for feet because they couldn't get to them fast enough uh, when they were working on the pathology. So yeah, um, imagine walking into the storage fridge and there's just a box with a foot in it. It's pretty much how it was. So yeah, I mean, we can think of these things, diabetes and kidney disease and flu even, how far they are down from COVID. We forget how serious COVID was, right? Now, a lot of people with their vaccines, your vaccine, you might still get sick and a lot of people will complain about that. I had my vaccine, why am I still getting sick? Well, these strains are evolving faster than we thought they would, but the vaccine has significantly increased people's ability to survive as well as lower symptoms for this disease. So now it's more like getting a bad cold instead of putting you in the hospital. So that's what the vaccine has done for us. And there's there's a lot of evidence for that. But so don't poo poo on the vaccine. It does work to some extent. Okay. I don't know. Sorry, I'm just trying to decide what I need to go on over here. So most of this stuff is just what I already said. So that's what's happening. Um, archaea and bacteria, those akaryotes that don't have the nucleus, they are smaller typically than the eukaryotes, like our cells, we're eukaryotes. So our individual cells are still going to be bigger than the bacterial cells that might be colonizing our gut, for example, typically. Our acellular crap, our viruses and our prions, super tiny. Um, here's some pictures of some things that cause diseases. We have a helminth at the top left. That's our, um, whatchamacallit, tapeworm. And then we have fungus, we have protozoa, we have bacteria viruses all the way down to prions which you would need a special microscope called an electron microscope to look at it literally rains electrons down on things and that's how they create images which i think is really cool professor maleko is trying to get us a scanning electron microscope i'm really excited about it you could actually see covid like that would be so cool but i don't think it'll get approved <laughs> um anyways let's move on so we have this idea that microbes are causing disease, when it's communicable, you had to get it from something, right? Makes sense to us back in the day, they didn't have this concept. So back in the day, they thought things came from spontaneous generation or maybe something you might've heard of miasma, bad smells. So they thought people were getting sick from that sort of stuff. That's why you see plague doctors with the mask. The reason the masks are the way they are, they shoved like flowers and herbs into the mask so they couldn't smell the smells from the plague. Um, they thought that was protecting them from getting sick. So that's why it is that way. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, they didn't have any idea what was really going on. Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, um, he came up with this idea. Well, you say spontaneous generation. These things are just coming out of nowhere. Um, life can just spontaneously pop up out of nothing. He said, no. He said, let me make this flask. Let me make sure that I've killed everything in it and then set it out. If it's spontaneous generation, things should just grow in it, right? However, he has that little skinny neck so things can't get in it. However, um, if you, uh, so you can kill all the microbes that were in that. Anyways, nothing would grow. It can't be spontaneous generation. You have to actually expose it to an environment or to something in order to contaminate it and then get something to grow. So that's what Pasteur did. This is um, kind of basically how he came up with germ theory. Germ theory just says that diseases are caused by germs. If it's communicable, if you can get it from person to person, something had to be spread. The germs. That's all germ theory is. 
not too bad, not too bad. Then we have the microscope guys. There's their names. I'm not going to test you on it. It's not on your paper, but FYI. <laughs> okay, they were there. Um, Van Leeuwen, Hoke, and Hook. They are the guys that are involved in developing microscopes that allow us to look at our microbes. Um, when we're trying to study our microbes, study things and learn things about them, I can tell you all day about um, how staph is a gram positive and how it grows on salt media and all this, da 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 da, da. But somebody had to try to figure that out first. And so even if as simple as, you know, being gram positive, that stuff, um, even as simple as that, we would have to start someone, right? Make some sort of guess and then try to follow up and see if we can prove it right or wrong. That's the scientific method. We know that. Um, you have this issue going on. You say, hey, I think that this is what's going on. And you make a little experiment and you test it. You probably do it more than you think just on a day-to-day -day basis. So don't apply it too much to like sciencey, fancy types. It's not really just that. Even just trying to figure out like where your car keys went or like <laughs> dealing with your kids or something. Um, all right. So this is the idea of the scientific method. Again, as long as you know what a hypothesis is, I think we'll be fine. Most of us know that by now. Um, you could have taken at least one science class like chemistry and I know they probably talked about this stuff in there so I'm not gonna get too deep on that all right this guy John Tyndall again not gonna test you on him, but he was interesting he did find that that um, microbes in the dust in the air might have high heat resistance so this is why if you boil something you can't actually sterilize it in case you haven't heard um, you can kill a lot of microorganisms but you can't kill everything because there are some things that are just resistant one of the things, C. diff. It's super resistant. They have, C. diff specifically has structures called endospores that are that allows it to survive harsh conditions. Another one that probably makes more sense to you guys as an example, anthrax. Anthrax, um, we know, easy to transport in powder form. Most microorganisms don't do well like that, being dried out. But anthrax does because it creates endospores, so it's protected by the structure they create. Um, so yeah, you can't, you can't boil out anthrax. You can't boil out C. diff. So, um, this guy realized that. So what he did see was that if he boiled something and it killed every other guy in there, the microorganisms in the endospores would come out and be like, Hey, there's no other competition here. And they would grow. And then they would boil it again and kill them while they, before they made new endospore forms. Um, and they do that a couple times just to be sure. And that allowed them to actually sterilize something. It's called tindalization. I mean, it involves waiting like over like days and hours and all this stuff, but really interesting concept. Um, we don't use that really in practice anymore. For the most part, if you want something sterile, if you want your endospores killed, your C. diff and whatever, then you're going to have to autoclave it. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the autoclave, maybe not interacted with the autoclave if you work at a hospital or have worked at a hospital or in a vet's office, um, they have autoclaves there and they autoclave a lot of their surgical instruments so they can reuse them. It creates pressure, heat, and steam that's going to kill off anything, except for prions, but we can get to that later. So you, now I'm gonna tell you guys about how everything you're touching is covered in mad cow disease. <laughs> it's, like, it's not really that way, but, um, but yeah, it sort of feels that way when I tell you that it can't be destroyed by that. Um, so aseptic technique, what it really wants you to get out of this concept of aseptic technique, because we're going to be using aseptic technique in the lab, right? Aseptic technique is just the concept that you are not contaminating what you're working with, with stuff from outside of that thing, and you're not contaminating the environment around you with what's in the thing. So both are being protected both ways, right? Um, so don't forget that. It's not just about protecting your sample that you're working with. It's also about protecting everything else or everybody else. Don't splash your eye with, you know, the culture or whatever. Um, not that I've ever had that happen, but don't, okay? <laughs> don't do that. I have a lot of people dropping tubes and those breaking, but that's, I can clean that up. It's no biggie. So this guy, Joseph Lister, realized that like, hey, if we want to prevent contamination in areas, why can't we apply that to surgical field? So he did. So he introduced hand washing, and misting with chemicals in the um, operating rooms and significantly saved lives. I mean, massive, massive lives being saved, okay? Um, I don't know, I think it's pretty impressive they thought to do that. He used phenol, if you guys have ever heard of phenol, that's what he used. Carbolic acid is the same thing. Um, so that is what uh, Lister did. 
So going back to Pasteur, remember he proved that no spontaneous generation has to start from something, germ theory. So he was the big daddy of all of that. And then Robert Koch was a guy that came along um, supporting germ theory, showing causative agents. So, hey, you're sick. I can actually isolate what's causing that. And we can say this is definitively what's causing the disease. He discovered anthrax that way. Speaking of. All right, this part is stupid, but I have to teach you it anyway. That's nomenclature, taxonomy, stuff like that. We have binomial nomenclature. We have this, we have the genus name and the specific epithet. Okay. That's just the two words. I'm, and that's really all I'm going to ask you about the nomenclature, honestly. But um, if I write down Escherichia coli, E. coli, okay. If I were to write that down, um, if you were writing it by hand, oh no, where did the, no, I want you to write on the board. If I write, Escherichia coli, okay? Capital on the first one, okay? Lowercase on the second word. This is the specific epithet that I'm talking about. So that's the species. This is what defines the species of it. But this is the whole species name. I know we don't know we You guys know that E. coli. Well, it's E. coli, not just coli, right? So E. coli. And um, so that's fine to abbreviate it that way as well. We talk about Staphylococcus aureus. We abbreviated Staph aureus. That's a really I don't say improper, but it was a informal, informal way. So you should be abbreviating it. Staphylococcus aureus, then down to X aureus. I don't care, but I have to tell you that, right? So um, if you are handwriting it, you will underline. If it is in um, typing, you're supposed to italicize. Again, I told you. Probably never going to test that on you guys. I mean, I have to know it's going to be in the test, but I'm not going to like get your papers in from your reports and it's not italicized and give you guys all these points off for that. It's stupid. I don't care enough. I don't think it matters. So, hey. Um, but yeah, so that's how we're going to separate these guys. We'll give them their special names and put them all in these little pockets of science that we can, you know, figure out what's what. That's the idea of taxonomy. Um, does, is this thing an akaryote or a eukaryote? If it's a eukaryote, is it, you know, animal, plant, whatever, and what domain would it fall into? And then break it down and break it down and break it down. So they have all these fancy words for it that I'm not going to have to make you learn, but you have to know the, this, okay, the layers of taxonomy. Domain, I'll just let you guys know, because that's an easy one. Domain is just bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So akaryotes and eukaryotes, okay? Um, then everything else I'm not gonna ask you specifics of. There are five kingdoms. I'm not gonna ask you what they are, right? Just be aware of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species in that order. However you, it works for you, you remember KPCOFGS, write it down on your scratch paper that I give you for the exam. And that's, you know, you refer to that if you need to. And I say, what well, comes before this? All right, does that make sense? That's how I'm gonna pull that out of the hat. All right, phylogeny. This is just separating these guys out based on their DNA. So it turns out, you guys have learned about kind of proteins. Yes, a little base, base idea of protein. Proteins are made by these structures in the cell called ribosomes. It's kind of the machinery that drives all of it. And um, every living cell has to have ribosomes. So we can look at everything's ribosomes and compare them to each other, and that can help us put them in this tree. I don't know why you want to, but there it is. I say that, I actually did that in my undergrad. I was like, one of the projects I did was phylogeny. But yeah, so there's the domains. Yeah, we talked about the RNA and the similarities between them. So that's it for chapter one. At the end of each of my chapters, I have a little question that you don't actually have to answer. It's like more or less get you thinking about what we just talked about. Um, this for this chapter, what exactly is a pathogen and what kinds of organisms can be pathogens and uh, what is a disease? So you guys get thinking back on that for chapter one. Now you guys know what we're doing chapter two today, sorry, three. If you guys have looked at the textbook, I promise that it makes sense how I ordered the chapters. They changed it. Oh yeah, okay, we're right on schedule. 
there it is. Okay, um, chapter three, this is going to be dealing with the tools of the microbiologist, I guess, I don't know. Mostly I'm going to tell you about different kinds of media that the organisms can grow on and microscopes. That's kind of the basics of this chapter. Um, first, we're going to start off with five eyes. You can't read it all on this slide, but hopefully you guys can read it whenever you guys access the slides yourselves. They are available in the modules area um, on Canvas. So five eyes, we have inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. These are the steps that you would go through try to figure out what, what's causing, what's happening with whatever thing's going on, okay? Um, you ask yourselves these questions. And we're going to go through each of these steps because why not? Starting off, we're going to talk about inoculation. This is producing a culture. So when we talk about cultures, you're growing up your microorganism in something, a media. And um, when you do that, you have to put it in there first, and that's inoculation. Okay. Um, I usually, it says medium is singular and media is plural. I almost exclusively always say media. Don't judge me on my grammar, okay? <laughs> you guys know what's going on. So um, that's that's that. Uh, you know what it is. Inoculation is just introducing your microbes into that. Sterile means it did not have anything growing on it at all. There was no life on it. Um, There's no spores. There's no viruses. Okay. All righty. So there's different ways we can sterilize things, obviously, which you guys will learn in the lab if you've looked ahead at all at the lab stuff, which I think most people have. But um, you will see that we'll be using these metal loops to inoculate things. And the way that we sterilize those properly is incineration, right, with the Bunsen burner. We're just going to hold it in the fire and burn them alive. So, yes, it's you guys, yeah, I can do that every day <laughs> or every lab. Um, cool. So some organisms, they need certain things to grow. Some can grow pretty much anywhere. You just have to figure out what your organism is going to need. So we have all these different kinds of media you can use to look at your organism. It could be liquid, semi-solid, or solid of some kind. Typically, we're mostly just talking about liquid or solid. If I talk about auger, that's what I said earlier. That's a term that refers to solid. Okay, It's not this solid. It's like jello solid. Okay. But it has um, from algae. The auger came, is something that comes from algae that we use to solidify the media. So that the bacteria can grow on it on a surface. We can work with it easier that way. Um, and it makes it easier to spread it out so we can look at individual colonies. Um, so yeah, chemically defined versus complex. This just means you know exactly to the T what is in your media. Why wouldn't you know what's in your media? Why would you have complex? Well, when I tell you guys that we were working with things like brain heart infusion, or we're working with um, blood auger. That's just like blood auger, mixed blood mixed with normal media, um, sheep's blood. So is every single sheep's blood the same as another sheep's blood? No, it's just only important that there are blood cells there. So that would be complex because we can't define exactly what's in it. That's all it means. And we have functional type. This is basically what we're gonna be using um, the media for. General purpose for just growing things, and then, um, yeah, enriched means that we've en enriched it with something. So you guys know what this word means. Don't don't get too confused over these terms. Sometimes that's the hardest part of this. But enriched just means we've enriched it with a special ingredient, a growth factor. Now, if I tell you guys that I you can eat the cereal that's been enriched, you've probably heard this before. Cereal that's had vitamins added to it or something. Some crap like that. It was a bigger thing in like when I was a kid back in the 80s. But nowadays people want to eat organic and whatever. But yeah, we say it's enriched. It's been enriched with niacin or something else, right? Um, here, bacteria, they also need to have like vitamins and stuff like that. Now, when we add food, vitamins into our food, vitamin C, if you take tablets of it or you know, B12 or whatever it is that you need to add into your life. Um, or get from your food, that's because you can't make it for yourself. Your body can't make that thing for itself, right? If I take away all your vitamin C, what do you get? Scurvy, right? You die from it. You have to have vitamin C supplied to you. Your body, no matter what you do, can't make it. Bacteria are like that too. So things that we give bacteria like that, that's growth factors, right? So those bacteria, we call them fastidious. 
um, bacteria um, that need growth factors, and they grow on media that we call enriched. So that's what that is. Growing fastidious organisms um, on enriched media that's been enriched with growth factors. All righty. Um, the next two are probably the most important of all of the media that we're going to learn about. That's enriched, sorry, selective and differential. I was looking at the wrong word. Selective and differential. And we have a whole lab dedicated to just this concept. Um, so I think we're going to get to it in a moment. Yeah, yeah. We know about this. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. I guess we're going to get to it in a minute. I thought it was the next slide, but I was wrong. Um, we have artificial media and we have, you know, the more complex stuff. Cool. I don't know why that doesn't need to really be defined. But with the liquid media, you don't only just have like those broths that you guys have seen, like in the tubes where it's like liquid in the tubes, yellow, whatever. Um, we also have milk, milks that bacteria can grow in. And then like I was saying with brain heart infusion, infusions, those can be worked with as well. So those are kind of important. Um, Semi-solid, they can kind of clot at room temperature, depending on the organism that's growing in it or not. And uh, anyways, auger gives a solid state. It has to have a certain amount of it. I'm not going to test you on the amount. Just be aware that auger gives it a solid state. All right. Um, so our defined media, we know exactly what's in it. Our com complex media, it's general, made up of general concept things. Um, we don't know down to the gram or milligram or whatever, everything that's in it. That's all that means. Um, so we said general purpose, we said enriched, we already went over the growth factors. This is, a, this is what I was looking for. Selective and differential media. On the left, those two plates is talking about selective media. And on the right, we have differential media. I wanna explain what's going on. So you can see here, this is general purpose. You took your sample, swap your shoe, and you put it onto this plate, general purpose, anything you can go on, right? Then you also swap it on this plate, it is selective. Selective means some organisms can grow and others can't. So it could be gram positives only grow or gram negatives only grow. It could be a lot of different things depending on what's added to the media, right? Um, so yeah, anyway, you could see only some of those bacteria grew on here. So that's the idea. Selective media selects for the organisms that can grow under those conditions. All righty. Um, the other one, differential. We're not selecting anybody. This is just going to let us tell the difference, differential. difference. So we have our swabs from our shoe. Same organism columns will grow over here, but some of them maybe turn red from what's in there. Some maybe turn blue from what's in there. Some maybe not change the color when it's growing on it because of how they react to what's in the media. One of the most common things that we're going to see in our lab when we start doing this is color change from pH change. That's a big one. So we'll have pH change from fermentation, which you guys already know, fermentation can produce alcohol. But if I tell you guys about fermentation producing acid, if I were to tell you that, you know, uh, what is it called? Apple cider vinegar. Obviously that's fermented, yes. And the mother that's in there, that's the bacteria that fermented it and made the acid, the apple cider vinegar. Vinegar is an acid. Um, yeah, so one of the byproducts can be acid. Acid is low pH, right? Don't worry, don't worry. We're gonna go over chemistry on the next um, chapter two. You guys definitely wanted to, re to reprise all of that, yes. Um, so yeah, we get the concept here, selective media, selecting for something to grow, differential media. We can tell the difference based on how it reacts to something. So down here, you can see different colors of the organism. It's written with the organism that the name is. So E. coli is growing here, Klebsiella here. Um, and they just turn different colors based on crap that's in this media. It's chrome, chrome auger, I don't know much about it, but it has stuff in it that causes the bacteria themselves to change that color. Kind of neat stuff. Um, this is the type of thing we'll be doing in lab eventually. Um, this might be uninoculated, so nothing, it's just plain. Um, when we put bacteria on this one, it turned black on the bottom. When we had put on bacteria on this one, same two, kind of two, um, it turned to this. So this is air that's developed in here and we make gas from fermentation. Um, this is an example of a pH change where we have red to yellow. That's characteristic of um, phenol red pH indicator, which we'll be working with more than you have no, you have no idea. That'll be the second part of the lab, but yeah. And then the black stuff is from sulfur production, which we know bacteria can do that, right? But anyways, 
an important one, one of our differential media that will definitely be seen in a hospital is going to be blood auger. Blood auger is often used to identify strep or staph organisms, um, but primarily strep, um, based on whether they can produce something called hemolysins. Hemolysins, hemo blood, lyse means break apart. Hemolysins break down red blood cells and release the hemoglobin in it. So if you're really good at that, you can break down all the red blood cells around you and you'll get a clearing developed on that red bloody auger around you because you just broke it all apart around you. Uh, if you're kind of good at that, then you might have it turning greenish around you where you've just kind of broken down what's around you. Um, and if you can grow on it, but you can't visibly make any changes, then that's called the gamma one, okay? Um, so yeah, beta is the big time. That's how I always remember. Beta is big time. That's where you get the clearing going on. And alpha is um, going to be the incomplete, so the greening. Here's some images of that. And um, you can see here, even, like, I can't see apparently. I didn't put my glasses on. It's stupid. Um, all right, let's start here. This is our patient. Patient A, right? This is what their sample looks like. You can already say right off the bat, if we're only looking at that, that there's growth with clearing around it. Yes, the redness is gone surrounding this organism. So it was able to break down the red blood cells. So this is a beta hemolyzer. Um, if we compare it to three other bacteria, no, we know that there's like probably billions of different kinds of bacteria, but here's one, Enterococcus. It doesn't seem to change the media. It's just growing on it. That is a gamma. Alpha, here we can see there's greening in the area. This is the kind of strep, but not the kind that causes like strep throats, different kind of strep. And this typically will occur in like your salivary glands or in your mouth. Um, anyways, then we have strep pyogenes, streptococcus pyogenes. This is the one that causes strep throat. It also happens to be what causes um, rheumatic fever and scarlet fever and um, uh, what is it called? Necrotizing fasciitis, which is a big jump from the other two. Um, but yeah, it, it's actually involved in a lot of different diseases. I think you'd be surprised when we start going over those later on. But you can see that this compares best to the strep pyogenes. So you might even, if you're just looking at this only, you would be able to say, oh, this is probably strep. If you're only going off of that. So we have some um, media that are both selective and differential at the same time. Only certain things can grow on it, and those things that grow on it, we can tell based on how they react with it, what, what they can use or not in the media. So a good example, I feel like the best example to give is mannitol salt auger, which is what's shown over here. It's a red color naturally. Again, it has phenol red in it, so it's going to turn yellow if there's acid. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's just going to be red. So it's also a high salt. And that high salt concentration, not everything can handle that. Now, it shouldn't be too surprising when I tell you guys that. Your skin, pretty salty, especially compared to other areas of your body. If I were to lick you, then it's probably saltier <laughs> on, your, on your skin, right? So staph grows there. So staph is one of the things that's being targeted by this here. So it's high salt. We know it can survive the high salt. That's already like narrowed it down. Um, based on whether it can use mannitol, which is a sugar derivative, um, it'll make acid. And if it can make acid, it'll turn it yellow. If it can't, it won't. We can tell the difference between different kinds of staph, like staph epidermidis, which is obviously just on your skin, and staph aureus, which could potentially be like MRSA. Uh, MRSA turns it yellow like that. So that's useful. We're going to be using that in the lab as well. Okay, colony. A colony is a discrete mound of cells formed on the nutrient surface, right? You have to have a hard surface for this one. Um, and it comes from just one cell. So we have one single cell that had, we would spread everything out. That one cell grew up and just multiplied, multiplied, made a little pile, that dot. So anytime you see one dot of that, that's from one cell growing up. Um, we want to isolate that specific organism that you might have on the bottom of your shoe or whatever. We can do something called the streak plate method, which is one of the first things you guys are going to do in lab, actually, quad streak. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You take your sample, you like swab your shoe, da -da 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 -da, and then you put it on one area of, the, it's like number one down there, right? One area of that. 
um, plate. Then you will turn your plate, flame your loop, sterilize it, and then go back in maybe once or twice and then spread it out again to kind of dilute it out. Now what you're doing is just like if I gave you guys like a, net, a netting full of a bunch of bouncy balls and you're just dragging it along. Well, if you just dump it all right there, you're gonna have a pile of bouncy balls. But if you're looking for the red one, maybe you spread it out a little and you drag it with that netting out and let them fall out individually. One cell falls out and it grows into a colony. So that's what we're trying to do here. So we just keep spreading it and spreading it and spreading it. We do it four times, sterilizing our loop in between every time so we can you know, restart the process. In the fourth quadrant, you can see quite clearly on the plate they show us, we start to see the individual. It might come in the third. It just depends on the organisms, but you guys are going to do this and get some individual colonies. We also have pour plate method. This is literally just mixing the auger itself with your sample and then pouring it out and growing it. Spread plate technique is using a little hockey stick shaped thing. Um, you maybe get a liquid sample of whatever you're looking at and then put a drop of it on a plate and then use a little hockey stick to spread it out. It's very general. It's not very specific. But you can keep doing that and diluting literally with like um, saline or something and until you get individual colonies. Anyways, let's say you finally get your individual colony. You have your sterile media and you're going to put that one colony into your sterile media in a septic technique, right? Um, that would be an anexic culture when we grow it up. Anexic is just free of living things um, or pure culture is the same. It's the same, right? We just have the one organism that you're looking at, that's it. So it's our pure culture, it is anexic. Um, and then we can make subcultures from that. If you are trying to you know, look at specific aspects of your organism, like putting it on mantle salt auger, you're not just gonna put your original source straight on it. Yeah, you're gonna have your main culture that you grew up and then take from that to inoculate other media. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was talking about, subculturing into other media. All right, we have mixed cultures, which we have known organisms. We know what they are, but there might be more than one in our culture. And then we have contaminated culture. We knew it was sterile. We made a pure culture, and now there's something else popping up in it later. So that's been contaminated with something, usually by the, just the environment. There's a lot of different ways that we can um, look at microbes to determine who or what they are. Um, a lot of the times we have these tests that I'm looking at and showing you guys. They're testing whether or not this organism can use glucose or sucrose or whatever the heck else, okay? And if they can, they'll change it this color or not. Um, those are actually technically biochemical tests. We're seeing what that organism at the biochemical level can do. These tests that which you guys will be doing in lab later are actually used by hospitals, but they're not used in the same way that we do them in lab. We're doing like tubes and big growth but they have like these strips. You can just inoculate a whole strip and get all the answers at once. <laughs> Sorry, you guys don't get to do that. But <laughs> I used to work at a food testing company and then we did that a lot for listeria um, and salmonella. But anyways, yeah. So we have a lot of different ways we can look at things. We can even run them through a PCR, which I'm sure you guys have heard of, um, amplifies things by their DNA. Alrighty. Size of things, just showing you for comparison, the size of all these different kinds of cells. Typically your eukaryote with the true nucleus is gonna be much larger than our prokaryotes. Sorry, it used to be called prokaryotes. I mean, akaryotes is the same thing. Please excuse me if I say prokaryotes, it just falls out of my mouth. For decades, it was prokaryotes and not akaryotes. Um, anyways, magnifying things. Now we're getting to the, we're gonna run through the microscopes here. Refraction, we have light bending from the lens. That's giving us this sort of image, basically enlarging our image. Um, anytime you pass light from one type of substance into another, the greater the difference between those substances, the more refraction you're gonna see. So once you're ready to start looking at your specimen, you might not want there to be a whole lot of refraction. You might wanna minimize that. So that's where we come in with our 100X lens and the oil that we'll put on our slides um, so we can get a clearer view of that. Um, we're going to talk about what that does for it here in a second, but, and we can talk about the magnification of this microscope as well. So here's the general parts of the microscope. We're going to talk about this more in the lab, so I'm not going to focus on this here. I think that's, and it's also straightforward. Um, yeah, aspects of the microscope, good. That's fine. Great. 
the objective lens and the ocular lens. You have your sample on your slide, that little lens on the little rotating piece that's down here, this lens, it says it, but just so you were clear. Those are the objective lenses. Those are what's gonna be like directly looking at the specimen on your slide. It's gonna magnify through its lens and then there are some mirrors that it'll hit and then it'll go to the ocular lens, right? So what we've done is we've created an image that's the real image um, through that original lens. And now we're gonna look at it through a whole other lens after it's been mirrors and all this. So now we're creating the virtual image. It's like taking the first image and changing it. That's no longer the first image. It's a virtual image. Um, so the objective lens creates that virtual, sorry, that real image, the ocular lens, because it's been through everything by the time it gets to your eye, that's the virtual image. Well, it's not the pure image. Um, Cause there is a lens in the eyepiece, FYI. Our lenses on our microscopes are 10X and um, we have a 4X, a 10X, um, a 40X and a 100X objective lens that we'll be able to switch through. Um, if you were using a 40X lens and you're looking through the 10X eyepiece, that's gonna be 40 times 10. So it's a total of 400 times. So if you're looking at your specimen with your oil, which mostly we'll be doing, um, that'll be 100 times 10. So it's a thousand times what it really is. So what you're actually seeing through there is a thousand times bigger than what it actually is, which is kind of cool when you think about it that way. So that's, uh, that's the pathway that it'll follow. This is why we're talking about it being a virtual image, just because it's going through all these, this crap to get to your eye. Um, and this is that multiplication that I was talking about. You're just gonna multiply them. Okay, the oil. So I say we'll use oil to reduce that refraction. So we're using oil to reduce scattering of light rays due to the difference um, from glass to air. Air and glass, not very similar. The oil is much more similar to the glass. So that's why we use it. Reducing that, we get a much clearer image as a result. So you can see here, the light rays are kept in place and interacting um, with the lens, but we need them so we can get a clearer image. They just have similar similarities to prevent that light scatter. That's why we use it. Um, contrast is just trying to see the difference between things. Refractive index is a way to measure that. We have different kinds of microscopes. I'm not, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care the different kinds of microscopes. If you're interested in it, you can be interested. Um, I'll be happy to talk to you about them. I just don't care for this class. Um, preparing specimens, it depends on what you're doing with your specimen, yeah? If you need your specimen, you want to see it you know, swimming around in your sample, you might do a wet mount or a hanging drop mount. Similar concept, we keep the thing alive in the liquid you're working with and put like a slide over it and look at it just straight up. We'll be doing that in our lab. And um, you can see how this could be a mess though, because you're just putting liquid and putting a slide like, like a glass right on top of it and it sque squeezes out the liquid. Um, you guys are going to get your hands dirty probably from it. Imagine if you were working with something like the plague. You know, um, you might want to <laughs> not be thinking about that in this case. So, yes, yeah, so these are alive, but you might get dirty because you're handling a live specimen. Then we have fixed and stained smears. We're going to spread out our sample and allow it to air dry. Um, this is to protect like the structures whenever we put it in fire. <laughs> okay, Because if you put it when it's wet over the fire, it'll boil it and that'll ruin the cells, okay? So it is actually important to dry it first. Dry it first and then heat fix it. You're gonna pass your slide through the heat, um, the fire of your Bunsen burner, literally like three or four times. That'll kill your cells, secure everything to the slide and preserve um, the components of the cell. That's the whole point of heat fixing. So now we're ready to do our stain again so that we can get contrast. Um, there's a lot of different dyes that we can use when we're doing this. Basic versus acidic are the two main concepts here though. If it stains the cell, it's basic. That's because it has a positive charge. And when we learn about the outside of the cell, if you remember maybe from chemistry, for those of you that took the one that had biochem in it, um, we talk about phospholipids, they have a negative charge on the outside of the membrane. So that negative charge attracts that positive one, you know, because south to south is gonna repel one another. So negative to negative repels. So acidic is anionic, that's a negative charge. And then that we can use to stain the background for some cases, if you're interested in it. So that's the idea with this. 
positive versus negative stains. Um, I'm gonna go on. Because these are simple stains. A simple stain is just you use one common dye, just a dye, just to see the cells. Really easy. Differential stains, we're usually using different dyes to look at parts of a cell to see whether there is a part or not, right? Is this organism gram positive or gram negative? That's the gram stain. Is this organism acid fast or not? That's gonna be telling us that whether it's tuberculosis basically. Um, is this organism producing endospores like anthrax does? Um, does it have a capsule that's a protective coating that a lot of bacteria have? You wanna see those things. So this is just going really quick over those. Gram positive, I, here's how to best to remember this. Of course, we're gonna talk about this again in the lab, but gram positive and gram negative are the absolute A number one most important concepts to remember about bacteria. If it is positive or if it is negative. Like typically I will be like, you'll bring something to me or ask me a question about, is this supposed to be blah, blah, blah? And I'll be like, is that your gram positive or your gram negative? Like I, that's where we start. So gram positive or gram negative, this is your bread and butter. Um, and it tells us a lot about the cells. We'll talk about that in chapter four, which by the way, Dr. Rhodes is gonna be joining us on Thursday, next Thursday. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's that time of year where everybody gets assessed. So we'll just be hanging out, watching me talk at you. So um, gram positive, purple, positive purple, negative. I think negative is red. Personally to me, red is a negative color and red is close enough to pink. I they say pink on here to me, the stain itself is red. Um, even, if it, even if it pulls pink after the dye, but yeah. That's how I remember, negative, red, the positive purple. All right, acid fast. Here we'll just be able to tell if you um, are acid fast or not. I don't wanna talk too much about this right now because we're gonna talk about it in chapter four, but basically anything that is a mycobacterium something. So that's all we really care about, mycobacterium, blah, blah, blah. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium leprae. Those are like the two medically important ones. Um, anything mycobacterium will stay in acid fast positive, nothing else will. This is a pretty good identifier. If your patient comes into your ER coughing, a uh, homeless patient comes into your ER coughing, um, you wanna get a sputum sample and send it to the lab to get an acid fast stain. Really quick, you can stain the sputum itself right away. What do you think the odds are that that homeless man would have tuberculosis in Oklahoma though? What do you guys think? Pretty low or pretty high? Very high actually. So <laughs> you guys do know that tuberculosis uh, affects a third of the world. So that's something to remember. We have it in um, the United States, it's actually a problem. Homeless populations, AIDS, um, people like that, they are more likely to have it and then spread it amongst their populations. Not uncommon. We actually had 14 people at an Edmond High School last year, I think it was, maybe the year before, that were that had tuberculosis. So that's why they test the PPD test. They're not just doing it just because for formalities. You could actually have it and be carrying it around. So um, yeah, it's not too difficult to get it and it's extremely difficult to treat, uh, like over a year of treatment drugs. So. It's like, like I said, if you have a homeless guy come into your ER and you're, he's acid fast positive, he's got tuberculosis and you dispute him. And you're like, okay, well, here's your drug regimen over the next nine months. I need you to take these drugs. What do you think he's going to do? Yeah. So it's hopeless. It's just pointless. And not to mention there's extremely uh, drug resistant strains out there right now. So. Yeah, tuberculosis is a very serious thing. Still, wait till I tell you guys about rabies. That's my favorite. So um, yeah, endospores, protective. That's only gonna be bacillus, which I told you about, um, bacillus anthracis and clostridium. Clostridium difficile was one that I talked about. All right, we're almost there, we're almost there. Um, like for example, if we're doing a special stain to see if you have a capsule or not, we will use that negative stain to stain the background. So that's what that blue is. You can see the cells themselves kind of have that purplish color, that white around them is the capsule. It didn't get stained. It's pretty cool. You guys are going to do this stain. It's one of my favorite stains. You have to stain to see if they have flagella. The flagella are the things that bacteria use to move around. All right. So we got to the last question of the chapter, and I'm aware that this is the end of the class.
So while you guys are doing that, when trying to isolate several separate bacterial species from a mixed culture for identification, why would you want to avoid using selective media at first during the isolation phase? Yeah, because you want to be sure you're actually giving your organism a chance to grow. You don't want to be isolating the wrong thing, the thing that grew when your thing didn't, right? So that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. All right, everybody good? Got picture? 